It's Dad. Dad and I haven't always seen eye to eye. The one thing that we always have seen eye to eye is our gratitude and affection for our Partnerships. I would not have been born if it were not for the partnership between my mother and father. I would not be standing before you tonight if it was not for them. Partnerships. Breeder keepers, veterinarians, instructors, puppy raisers, volunteers. All of you here tonight are also partners with a fantastic organization, and I thank you all very much. I'd like to share with you tonight the partnerships that I've had with my four fantastic Like that said, it all began back in 1969. I was diagnosed with juvenile onset diabetes, got the insulin dependent kind. I did pretty well for the first couple of years. Then my teenagers kicked in, and I became very rebellious. I dealt with a severe eating disorder for a while, and in 1982, I started getting laser treatments on my eyes due to diabetic retinopathy. At that time, I was still pretty much optimistic and thought I could beat anything. Thought I was immortal. Little did I know that my vision was so. In 1983, I had to give up my beloved Torino, Old Blue. Had to give up my car keys, and that was like giving up my independence. Didn't want to see my cousin go old in the way. I decided to join a diabetes support group and truly get my health together. And that's where I met Linda King. Linda had her life together. She was working on her doctorate degree. She was in the soup. She had her own home in downtown Lafayette. And she had this fantastic golden retriever guide dog named Delta. I wanted to be like Linda. So my first goal before I could get a guide dog was to learn mobility and to learn to use the white thing. I did that, I applied to Guide Dogs, and I was accepted in 1985. I was to get a male black cat named Egan. Egan was the greatest. He gave me back the independence that I thought I'd lost when Old Blue drove away. We traveled to the National Federation of the Blind Convention in Louisville, Kentucky. We flew to visit a friend who was attending the University of Virginia and saw the sights in Washington, D.C. on that trip. After all the jet setting around, I came back home and my mom sat me down at the kitchen table and she said, Miley, I think it's about time for you to get a job. She had an ad cut out for a temporary customer service representative at Bank of America. Egan and I interviewed for that job. We got the job and worked the temp job for about six months and then we were offered a full-time job in what was then known as the home banking department as customer service representative. Well, I was a customer service rep. He was my expert. <laughs> we met a lot of friends, new friends there. I got great performance reviews and had a pretty successful career. A little few years later, I got a condo in downtown Concord, and I felt like I was a real bona adult and a real grown up at that point. I met a real good girlfriend, Anna. And we decided that we were going to go to the exotic erotic ball. <laughs> it's a Nazarene. You all know what it is, obviously. <laughs> Anna was going to be a black with gap, and I was going to be Little Red Riding Hood, and Egan was going to be Big Battle. <laughs> it was all planned. We had our costumes all around. Two weeks before the exotic erotic, Egan started exhibiting signs of illness. We took him to the vet, and the vet thought he had Lyme disease. Unfortunately, it was far worse than that. He had liver cancer that had metastasized into his lungs. Same weekend as the Oakland Hills fire, Egan died. It was that kid. My heart was broken. I felt like the independence that had been given me to me when I picked up that harness for the first time was time was snatched away. Someone from Guy Dust, and I don't know who it was, but whoever that person was, I am grateful to them. Encouraged me and said that my 
my part was to connect, to love, and move on. So off I went to guide dogs and got my second dog. Acorn served as the ring bearer on our way. He wore a tuxedo that was loaned to him by someone that we met at the holiday luncheon at the St. Francis Hotel, an annual event that takes place. Um, it's a fundraiser for guide dogs for the blind. Someone there said, oh, I have a wonderful outfit for Acorn to wear in the wedding. So he was our ring bearer and we did a dynamite job at that. He could do anything. At that time, my job was in downtown San Francisco. There's a lot of um, manhole covers, distractions, um, cracks in the sidewalk, things that made Acorn as it got a little older, a little more neurotic. Unfortunately, it was harder and harder for him to deal with some of those, those things. But he didn't quite retire. He went to go live with my mom and dad, and that's when dad started bringing Acorn to guide dogs to the blind, and they started doing volunteer work together. So if any of you ever took a tour with Fred George in the late 90s, you would have met Acorn, and you would have known what an irresistible dog Acorn was. When Acorn retired, I did go back up to the school with my heart ready to accept another dog. Enter Huntley, another black lab. Huntley got to go to Hawaii with us. He was one of the first guide dogs that didn't have to go through any kind of quarantine or anything. And we had quite an exotic time. He looks like quite the Kanaka up there, doesn't he? Huntley was a very sensitive and intelligent dog. I was, as you know, a diabetic, and I had a very long commute to get down to the clock tower in downtown San Francisco from Pacifica, which is where we were living at that time. It was a 10-minute walk to the bus stop, then a bus ride to Coma Bar, Bart ride from Coma Bar to the Embarcadero Bart Station, and then a 20-minute walk from the Embarcadero Bart Station up to the clock tower at First in Madison. I always had to make sure that I had enough sugar on board or my blood sugar was high enough before I started the commute either way. But one day I got off the bus in Pacifica, headed home, and I was very disoriented. My blood sugar was extremely low. I didn't really realize it at the time, but I, my mind just kind of blacked out. And before I knew it, without any of my command, Huntley was able to get me to my front doorstep so that I could drink a bunch of juice and get my blood sugar back up. That was just one occasion that I really truly, truly feel like my guide dog saved my life, kept me safe. The office moved to Concord. One of the streets we had to cross to get to the office in Concord every day was Clayton Road. And what I found out later was that Clayton Road is banked in such a way that the middle is higher than either curve. So for a, a person, a dog, <laughs> who was 21 inches high, he couldn't see the opposite curve from the side of the street that we were standing on when I gave him the forward command. So he was very reluctant to cross the street. We sent the company back up to the school to work with instructors to see if we could get him accustomed to um, crossing streets that were banked in this way, but it, he, he didn't really seem to want to do that. So he returned and went to go with my sister up in Roseville. So I went back up to Guide Dogs, and I got my wonderful furry friend, Flanders. <laughs> Flanders is my first female. She's the most courageous, the most funky, and the most challenging of all the dogs. <laughs> She adores my friend Mark. In fact, I think she's the happiest when the three of us are together and she's doing her job. She's nine and a half now, and I know that her day will come too. But after my past experience, I know that my heart is truly big enough to make more room. Egan, Acorn, Huntley, Flanders, and who knows who next. And it's thank you to all of you who have made this wonderful program possible. Thank you.